marriage we could not uh, continue for the last so many weeks and we almost came something close to a climax and we stopped and this is probably the most uh, important chapter for people to understand what the book of revelation is all about and many of us who have been following right from the beginning of the book of the study of revelation with us by now even these chapters would have been a lot more easy for us to understand and we read from chapter 21 verse 9 to verse 14 that's a passage for today revelation chapter 21 verses 9 to 14 and there came unto me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of seven last plagues and talked with me saying come hither i will show thee the bride the lamb's wife and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city the holy jerusalem descending out of heaven from god having the glory of god and her light was like unto a stone most precious even like a jasper stone clear as crystal and had a wall great and high and at 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels and names written thereon which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of israel on the east three gates on the north three gates on the south three gates and on the west three gates and the wall of the city had 12 foundations and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the lamb may god bless the reading of the scriptures when we started the book of revelation right at the beginning we spoke about the kind of imagery that the book uses and we said that in all the imagery we need to understand that this is a book that discusses two groups of people now this particular passage in front of us about the new jerusalem coming down has been interpreted people by various ways and destroyed the passage even though the other portions of scripture are very clear through that for example there are many people who said this is heaven now when you read the chapter you understand that it's a new heaven and new earth that we're talking about and in the new heaven and new earth you have the new jerusalem coming down so this is not the new heaven then there are people who say that this is the time of the millennium period which is being described this is not even that in fact this is what we have seen all along that in the book of revelation the church is called by different terms different names different imagery and this is the final imagery that we see about the church in its completion in all its aspects now when the bible talks about a city here we need not take it in the sense of a literal city and since we can say since the city is mentioned it has to be a city it's not quite not quite true no one can say since it's written as a city it has to be a city and cannot be a church why because in the book of revelation itself we have seen and in the other books of the bible we have seen that the church is described in various ways if you remember it's been called as a body it's been called as a temple of god it's been called as a flock of sheep now none of these imageries you would take blindly and say this means actually it is a body no it's an imagery similarly when we speak about this instance here this city that we speak about this is a reference to god's church now how do we know this one most important things that you need to remember here is how does this vision start now last time if you remember the last session i i know it might be asking for too much but in the last session remember we said we saw and if you want to see the continuation of that chapter we saw things that would not be there in the new jerusalem so in in the new heaven and new earth if you if you turn with me uh, to revelation 21 verse 1 and you'll see that a new heaven was made he saw a new holy city come down and then we saw in verse 8 the things that were not there but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers 
and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So these people are not there in the new heaven and the new earth. So the new heaven and new earth is not equal to the new Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem is not the new heaven. But in the new heaven and the new earth, the new Jerusalem is going to come down. And that's what we need to study. So I hope till here you have been able to pay attention. Now let's see again, but it's very obvious from John's writing that this new heaven, sorry, this new Jerusalem is the church. For example, let's see who opens the vision. Verse 9. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. So she's referring to the lamb's wife, the bride, and she's showing a city. Then, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that city. In fact, the word great there is not there in the original Greek as which is rendered in the, uh, in the KJV. It just should be showed me that city, which is the Holy Jerusalem. Now, if you remember your book of Revelation, you'll notice this is very similar to what happened when the other woman before this was shown. Remember? Babylon. Babylon, the great mega city, when it was shown, we read almost very similar to this. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 17, verse 1. If you're there, I'll read it for you. 17, verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying, Unto me, come hither, I'll show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of a fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit in the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. You see the similarity? Here in Revelation chapter 17, one of the same angels, one of the angels of the same group, show him a city. And this time he's taken into the wilderness and he sees a city and that woman is called as a whore. You see the comparison? When we study Babylon, we said Babylon is a representation of all the wicked people in the world, all the wicked temptations in the world which war against the Christian. So you have two cities. One is the mystery Babylon, the great Babylon, who's called as a whore, who's immoral, who seduces the world's people, who even tries to seduce the saints, who's drunk on killing of the saints. This is mystery Babylon. Now, in chapter 21, John is taken up again, this time onto a mountain. And this time, instead of seeing down, he sees up. And now he sees, instead of a whore, he says he's seeing the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And it's again mentioned as a city. And that's important. So here, we are not looking at an actual city. Rather, we see a people of God. And that's what cities in ancient, in ancient cultures, particularly in the ancient biblical culture, the city was supposed to be the final consummation of human civilization. Every small place would want to become a great city. So this passage is extremely symbolic of what the group of people have come together as and called as a city would be like. And it would be completely wrong to interpret this passage literally as a city falling from the sky. Some of these things can really not be even true for what is happening to uh, cities. And plus, when you read this whole text carefully, you cannot but notice the symbolic nature of everything that you see. And the entire portion from here is full of rich symbolism. And if you remember your study of Revelation correctly, if you remember your numbers correctly, I don't think this passage would be any difficult for you. I want you to remember every imagery that is given here has already been done in this book before, in the same book before. So it should not become difficult. First and foremost, as I said, this isn't a part 
a picture of a millennial city on the earth. Why? You can just look at the measurement of the city in verse 16. Can you turn to verse 16? It says this, and the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as the breadth, and he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs, the length and the breadth, and here's the uncommon thing, and the height are equal. The length, the breadth, and the height are equal. Now, if anyone has a NIV, I guess, and then we actually translate, translate this 12,000 number to a literal uh, number, literal number for today's. So it might be translating them into uh, something 1,400 miles. So the, the length of the city is, it is 1,400 miles in every direction. Now, I do not know whether you can imagine how much is... 1400 miles. China's breadth would be possibly 3,500 miles. This size of the city is bigger than what we talk about countries today. And this is a perfect cube. You have got 12,000 and 12,000 on both the sides. 1400 miles, when we translate that, it's very unfortunate because what happens is though you have the, the actual measurement, but you lose the charm of the figurative here. The, the reason the Bible uses the word, the number 12,000 to show us perfection. Now, why does it show us? So when, whenever we measure cities, we measure cities maybe in bits, but here, or we, or we measure it in uh, the radius, but here we measure it as a perfect square. Right? Now what is odd, why is the height of the city given? Now that's, that should be a question that we need to ask. What do you mean by the height of the city? Because obviously these are not the heights of the walls of the city. Because the height of the walls are given later, which is a point that we're going to come back to. So what is the point of giving a height of a city? Now, it's 12,000, 12,000 at height, 12,000. It's a perfect cube. Now, I would want, if anyone wants to unmute the, the phone and give me the answer to this, where in the Bible do you find the perfect cube? Where in the Bible do you find the perfect cube? The temple measurements. Oh, uh, no. Okay. But something inside the temple measurement. You are close. You are very close, sister. The Holy of Holies. The, the Holy of Holies. In okay. Which, okay. Right? And so here the imagery is very clear to show us again who these people are. What is the kind of privilege that they have? It is not a millennial city, but rather to show what the members of this city would be. Because the height is a strange thing to give. Because you would not measure a building height and say the city is this height according to the height of the building. But that's not what has been done here. So this whole city that we're talking about is a group of people of God. Now, let's see what else does the, the chapter talks about. 21 verse 9. And come hither, I will show thee the bride and the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that city. So you see what's happening? He's supposed to show the bride's wife. And instead of looking at a woman, what does he see? He sees a city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And there's nothing more blessedness that a Christian can find out about his origin. A Christian's origin, a Christian originates 
because he is born because of God. He is not born because of human will. He is born because God has chosen him and God has kept him and God will keep him. The new Jerusalem comes out of heaven being pure and holy. And we saw this consistently in the book of, of Revelation. For example, you remember the one like 44,000? Do you remember what they were called? They were called as virgins. So here, the one like 44,000 was called as virgins. And you see the mystery Babylon is called as a whore. Again, if you, if you have your maths right, and you see the measurement of the city, and you want to see what the city encompasses, you simply have to measure 12,000 into 12,000. You see the number you get. So the whole idea is showing the same group of people in a new way. But look at the beauty of this city. And this should make our evening. This holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, that's beautiful. Till now, we have always learned that God does not share his glory with anyone, then his son. But now, this city has the glory of God. What has the city done? What has this woman done to even get this kind of thing? But it does not stop there. Look at the beauty of the description. When I was reading this passage and for some reason I was thinking about the song that Adam wrote for Eve when Adam saw Eve and it was an earthly husband though holy but earthly singing in the beauty of his wife. But here, you have the most holy God's son, who is most holy in self, who has made a woman, a group of people who are wicked and sinful, not clean, cleaned by his blood, making them part of heaven, giving them the glory of God, and all that you see here is a description for me that the husband is thinking about his dear bride. This is a husband's delight in his wife. This is the beauty in which the husband sees his wife. Beloved, this is amazing for a church to be called this way, sharing the glory of God. This is exactly what Christ prayed for us in his high priestly prayer. In fact, if you remember what we did in the book of Revelation earlier, and you see that after the initial chapters, and when John sees God on his throne, you remember the scene? There was lightning and thunder, and he sees a scene which was completely indescribable. And John has to again use the same terms that he uses here. Like I saw, it was like this. It was an emerald, like it was the sea of glass. He, he just couldn't explain it enough. And that same glory of God can be seen in this holy Jerusalem. Let's look at the description. A light was like unto a stone, most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now, I, I do not want to go into the details of why different kinds of stones have been given here. We will read that about in, even later, right? And why certain stones have not been used, like diamonds and not been used. And there are a lot of theories around it. But sufficient to say this, most of the stones, or rather all the stones that you see, are the stones that you'll find on the breastplate of the high priest. But more than that, the point is, I don't think John is seeing a jasper stone. But what John is seeing 
is he doesn't have any other stone to or any other thing to describe fully. So he says it's like a jasper stone because we would never fathom what John wants to describe. But here's something that he makes. It is clear as crystal. Meaning when light is passing through it in the most purity, no one can detect a single crack or a single flaw in this great city. This is perfect. No man in the world has ever made a perfect cube. That's, that's the reason we call these things to be a, a, a platonic I, uh, shapes because it can never be made in the world. It only exists in the mind and it exists in the mind of God to begin with. And so it exists. This city is perfect in size, in purity. Now, if you are the first century, you'd always think cities are subject to attacks. Cities are subject to destruction. The greatest cities in the world have been destroyed. Greatest civilizations in the world have been destroyed. So when a city was made, a city was usually understood or known by the height of the walls. For example, some of the earlier cities would have heights as much as 10 meters. And most, and the higher the wall would be, the greater and the stronger would be the protection of the walls. And here's how the city is destroyed. They're described, sorry. And here's the term. And had a wall great and high, and at 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. On the east, three gates, on the north, three gates, on the south, three gates, on the west, three gates. A perfect square, and each side, there are three gates. And there are angels who are guarding the gates. Now, again, what we saw sometime back, we saw how we start the book of Genesis, the book of Revelation gives a fitting end. Remember the book of Revelation? when Adam and Eve after their sin were thrown out of the garden and there was an angel kept there so that they would not go back into the garden. And God shows that no one can enter into the garden anymore by keeping an angel there and the sword. But now again, you have angels kept at the, four ga at the 12 gates with the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So again, you see this group of people, this city, which is not simply a new, new, a new Testament group. It's a mix of both the saints from the very beginning of the Old Testament to the last person who's going to believe in the Lord on the earth. All of them together. But again, you have the 12 tribes and we know of the importance of the Jewish identity of the church where the Lord came for a group of people from that community. Each side three gates to show people being welcomed from every direction. This group, this church or this world community is not getting in people only from a particular race or a particular kind. This is not a group of, we can say, only of the elite or people from this country cannot join or people from this community cannot join. It's open on all sides. And as the Lord said, people will come from east, west, north and south into the kingdom of God. And that's what's happening now. This city which is pictured symbolically, the people of God, people from everywhere, everywhere, would be a part of this. The reason I keep focusing on this is because of the things that's happening in America and all the other countries, the whole talk about racism and how churches do not understand each other and we are different. The Bible completely belies all those ideas. Bible very clearly explains to us why racism is sin. We do not treat people differently, not even for better or for worse. 
we treat them as they're part of one community, one blood. And that's what this imagery is all about. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, on the west three gates. And the wall of the city, verse 14, had 12 foundations. And in them, the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. We again see the importance of the apostles. We see the 12 foundations. And this is not that the city was made. We all understand that the Bible keeps saying that the entire New Testament has been made based on the foundation teachings of the apostles. It is not changing. So whenever people think about this passage, they actually end up thinking that there would be names inscribed around the site. That's not the point. The church is built on the foundation of the apostles. And that's the reason we go back to the very word of God to study the importance of what the apostles are given to us. Next word. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb were written. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gate thereof and the wall thereof. And that city lieth four square and the length is as large as the breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs, the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. Now, if you remember, when we continued, we had studied the book, the chapter of Ezekiel, when we saw the chapters of Ezekiel. And you'll see a similar kind of image in the book of Ezekiel as well. Now, we will not go there, but I want you to just ask yourself, what is the point of that angel measuring the city? What is the point of the angel measuring the city? We saw a similar thing that they measured the temple earlier, remember? Now he's measuring the city. And what is he finding when he's measuring it? The, the point is he's measuring it with this such a huge city, half the size of the United States. That's the city's length. And he's measuring it. And his measure is perfect. Not an inch is missing. There is no error in the length and the breadth. The height is equal. This is God's city. This is a description of God's people. Not a single person will be lost. How do you know that? Look at verse 17. And he measured the wall thereof. And hundred and forty and four cubits according to the measure of man, that is of the angel. A hundred and forty four cubits by human measurement, which is also angel's measurement. By now, I think you would see how the entire thing is a symbolic moving around. It would be absolutely wrong to consider any of these numbers as for a literal city. Now look at the description. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, like clear glass. Gold, like clear glass. Now we all know the value of gold. We all know that in ancient cultures and even today, gold was the greatest riches that people could exchange to each other. In fact, I do not know this. Uh, do not, I do not know whether you know this, that gold is supposed to be a higher value material when it comes to transaction than even diamonds. In fact, the reason um, you do not find diamonds mentioned in this whole list, because in that point, uh, that point of time, diamond was not even considered to be an important, such an expensive stone. But gold, to human standard has been so important. And so to show the purity of that gold, see how it goes. The wall was built of jasper while the city was pure gold. I mean, the wall was built of jasper. I mean, the wall of what? The city. But the city itself was of what? It was pure gold. Like clear glass. That's the purity of the people of God. 
they are pure gold. They are refined in the fire of hardships. They are refined in the fire of the problems on the world. They are refined in all of this. And at the end of the day, God makes the city what it has to be. Gold, like clear glass. And not a scratch, not a dent. No problems in cutting, no problems in light reflected from it. It's pure gold. Then look at verse 19. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chiropraise, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. And then the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each of the gates made of a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Beloved, I've seen so many people try to draw these things and every time someone tries to draw these things, they've completely missed what God wants to show to us. These huge city had a huge gates, huge gates. And each gate was made up of a single pearl. Can you even imagine what kind of an oyster would have required to make that single pearl? It's an impossibility. But the point here is the size of the pearl, the larger the pearl, would be considered to be more precious. Here, these are the gates of that city. Meaning, no matter how much you can think about the value of this earth here, no matter how much you think about making your life here comfortable, no matter how much you think about things here precious, the moment you see what you are called for, all of these things pale in an instant. By the way, all the jokes of the standing at the pearly gate also falls flat, right? This 12 gates, and which were 12 pearls, are basically, again, something to show the church. Each of the gates made up of a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Now, it goes without saying, we have studied this even further, what? good would gold do to a Christian in heaven? What value would gold be for a Christian in heaven? What value of any of these things would be for a Christian in heaven? Then why does God use them? We understand in economics, uh, maybe we have done this in one of our sessions, that we said that nothing has a value of its own unless value is imputed to it. When you are in India, Gold might be more expensive than water. But when you are in a desert, the water would be more expensive than gold. So nothing has a value of its own except for God and His Son. But when God gives something a value, someone a value, He becomes valuable. So the streets of the city was pure gold is to show us in terms of what we decry here, what is going to be there? It's pure gold like transparent glass. Now, brothers, I do not want you to even try to imagine this. No, please don't do it. You're going to be just wasting your time. You cannot imagine gold which is transparent. You cannot. You'll be simply wasting your time. But I want you to understand something. If you are imagining a city in front of you, you are everything which is described here in this passage. What you're looking at here, brothers and sisters, this is us. 
This is us. This is the bride of the Lamb. This is the wife of the Lamb. Perfect in every size, in every length. Walls so high. 144 cubits. Not a single wall in ancient times for even half of that. It couldn't be, def it couldn't be ever defeated. Walls built of precious stones that throw out every possible color of light. Pure gold, transparent gold, transparent glass. That no one can see any fault in this. Beloved, we are the ones that God is showing to us right now. What is being displayed in front of our eyes, we are looking at our own self. Every woman who wants to get married always thinks about the day her marriage is going to happen. And there would be umpteen number of times she would have thought how she would look on that great day. What should be the best way that she should be dressed before she is brought in front of her husband. But you see what is happening. This is us. On that day when God puts us in front of his son. This is us. Pure. In every manner. Not a single person that God has chosen for whom Christ has died, no matter how cruelly Babylon would have treated and killed them, would be lost. Not even an inch is missing in the size of the city. Oh, what a great comfort this is for us. This is symbolic, brethren. But in the symbolism, if we do not see the beauty of how God sees us, how his son sees us, then we will not see the joy of that day. You know why we should struggle for purity? Because this is how his son sees us. Pure gold, like transparent glass. You know why our work should show the value of God? Because this is how his son sees us. Each gate made out of one pearl. You know why we should struggle for purity of doctrine because this is what how his son sees us built on the foundation of the apostles they cannot go wrong you know why should struggle for the glory of god in every aspect of our life be it our marriage be it our job be it our church because the church reflects the glory of god comes from the top. Come, I'll show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. John was looking at himself. John was looking with all the people like him who believed in the Son. John was looking at the surety that's going to happen, that if wicked Babylon is destroyed, this is what the believers are going to get at the end of all of that. The church will be invulnerable. Nothing can take this. The church will be universal. People from all directions will come in. The church has its foundation built on nothing else but God's word spoken by the prophets and spoken by the apostles. And the church will always stand for the glory of God. Always stand for the glory of God. 
we'll have to be check ourselves. This is what God calls us. I'm very sure. One hard look at ourselves and we'll be ashamed of what we're going to become. What we're going to become one day and what we are today. But I want you to take heart. Not because we are good people. We never work. But this is not something that was told to John. Ke come up here and this might happen, John. If you do well, if people on the earth who believe in the Lord, if they do well, this is what is going to happen to you. I want you to work hard because if you really work hard, this is your end. No. This is the bride, the lamb's wife. This is what she's going to become. Why? Because she comes down out of heaven from God. Are we failing in a Christian life? Is our ministry becoming weak? Is our personal life at this point of time falling? Take heart. This is the Holy Jerusalem. God will keep it pure. God will keep it with his light, with his glory. You can again and again and again read this passage. The city in which you are going to be living is going to be worthless. Even if it is paved with gold. But you yourself have no worth. But here you are called as the gold. As the one that the sun sees. And the sun calls it as the most beautiful thing for him to lay down his life for it. For this church. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Abba Master, we thank you for this brief time that you gave us after so many days. We thank the Lord that in all the days that we spent in the book of Revelation was well spent. So, so well spent. That when we come to read these passages, they're sufficiently clear, Lord. That probably earlier we would have struggled to understand. But by now, Master, you have taught us enough by your spirit to understand what are you going to make us. Help us, Lord, to see where we are going. What is our end? And so we can mend our ways. Our family, our children, our churches, ourselves. <laughs> 